All right, it looks like we got a pretty nice crowd here, so I'll get started. Um, so my name is Drew Festini, and I wanted to talk today about the feature of Linux on RISC-V. Um, if you want to, there's a tiny URL there um, that'll give you the slides. It's um, rv at the end there, slash rv dash Linux dash 21. I also just pasted it into the Slack um, for the Embedded Linux conference. So I'm a Linux kernel developer for Baylib, um, and we have five team members that are speaking at ELC this week. So yesterday, Neil Armstrong gave a great introduction to pin muxing and GPIO uh, in Linux. Uh, and it had been a long time since we'd had a pin control talk at ELC, so that was, that was quite nice. Uh, and then Bartos tomorrow uh, is going to be talking about some lessons learned from both libgpod and the GPO subsystem in Linux um, and the evolution of the API there. Uh, and then also tomorrow is uh, Kevin um, and Alexandre uh, from Baylib as well talking about uh, RISC-V support in Zephyr. I'm also on the board of directors of the Beagle Bordeaux Foundation, um, and I'm involved in our Beagle 5 initiative to create open source hardware boards, or open source hardware risk 5 boards. Uh, I'm also on the board of directors of the Open Source Hardware Association. So if you haven't heard of us before, one of the things we do is we have a certification program for open source hardware. So you can go and register your project as open source hardware if you'd like to. And I'm also an ambassador for Risk 5 International. So one of the things I wanted to highlight here before I get into my talk is what's going on with RISC V this week um, at Open Source Summit and ELC because there's a lot. So actually yesterday, Atish and Anoop from Western Digital gave a presentation about PERF on RISC V. Uh, and actually later today, um, there'll be a talk from Vitaly on XIP, which is execute in place. Um, so running, running directly from Flash. Um, and then also later on today, there'll be a tour um, of RISC-V for ARM developers. So um, this is from a couple people from, uh, I believe, Penguitronics that work on Beerbox. Um, and looking through the slides, I think it'll have some good um, correlations there if you're familiar with ARM, how things relate to RISC-V. Uh, and then also tomorrow, there's going to be a talk um, uh, about uh, Zephyr, uh, RISC-V support in Zephyr. And that was all uh, virtual, actually. So all those people, most of them are in Europe and they aren't able to attend. So the things that are happening in person is actually um, just prior to this, um, Kim from Risk 5 International gave a talk. Um, and then actually, I guess concurrently to this, there's also one about uh, an exciting new thing that's going on called the Open Hardware Diversity Alliance. So Kim from Risk 5 International is talking about that right now. So you, you'll be able to, I think, catch that in the virtual platform after this um, or stop by the Risk 5 booth in the expo hall. Um, and then Callista, who's the CEO of uh, Risk 5 International, will be talking later today at 4 p.m. And then on Thursday, we have a kind of a special event. So um, it's uh, kind of the theme is open hardware and open software. So it'll be people from the RISC-V and Zephyr communities. Um, so if you're interested in doing this, it's on Thursday morning. Um, you do need to add it to your registration. So if you stop by like the help desk, they can probably help you with that. But we've got like three hours of, of uh, things happening on Thursday morning. So if you, if you haven't had your feel at the end of these three days, then you can do that on Thursday morning. And then one thing I wanted to highlight was last week was Linux Plumbers Conference. So other than Embedded Linux Conference, I would say my other favorite conference is Linux Plumbers. And one of the things that's unique about Linux Plumbers is we have what's called microconferences. So they're like four blocks where there are short presentations and then a lot of discussions. So uh, a lot of, like RISC-V is still evolving and also the support for RISC-V and Linux is evolving. So there's a lot of things that we need to discuss um, uh, among developers and people working on the specifications. So um, there was uh, five sessions last week. Um, you can go watch the recording, the live stream. I also took a bunch of detailed notes. So uh, if, you're, if you're interested in RISC-V, which you're here, um, so you probably are, I highly recommend checking it out. And then coming up in December uh, in San Francisco um, is the RISC-V Summit. So it's co-located with the Design Automation Conference um, in San Francisco. So that should be exciting as well. You can still register for that. And then there's also meetups around the world. So if you go to community.risc5.org, you'll see there's a bunch of different meetups. Um, some of them are still doing virtual meetups, and then hopefully at some point in the future we can get back to having in-person meetups. And if you live somewhere where you don't see a group, um, you can actually start one. So um, there's information on community.risc5.org about how to start one if you're, if you're interested in doing that. And then something I started up recently, um, I guess just a few weeks ago, 
was I wanted to have a biweekly meetup um, for people to be able to interact in real time. And part of this is like we haven't had conferences in a long time. We aren't having in-person meetups. So it's just like mailing list, which is sometimes like insufficient for like human connections. So um, we started doing this thing biweekly where we just kind of do a video conference. Um, and it's kind of lo loosely formed. Like the idea is to kind of talk about open source software support on RISC-V and also development boards. Um, but it's pretty open. So uh, to make it kind of possible for people around the world to interact, we actually have one that happens uh, in Thursday morning in Asia. So the next one will be October 13th. So if you're here on the West Coast, it'll be in the evening. It'll be in the morning in Asia. Uh, and then November 3rd, we have one that's in the morning here in the, U in the West Coast, and it'll be late afternoon for Europe. So hopefully we can get everyone around the world involved between one of the two time, sl time slots. And if you're interested in maybe doing a short presentation, please get in touch with me. Um, otherwise, it's kind of an informal chat. Um, so, you know, this is uh, Embedded Linux Conference. So um, some of you are probably familiar with RISC-V, but if you're not, um, RISC-V is a free and open ISA. So it started back in 2010 with computer architecture researchers at Berkeley. Um, and they were looking for an instruction set to do their research projects around. And RISC-V kind of evolved from a three much a three-month project to like, uh, well, 10 years later now. Uh, and the main person behind it at the beginning was uh, Krista Asanovich. Um, and he has an interesting talk from the summit last year called RISC-V the next 10 years because it was the 10-year anniversary. So if you want to learn more about like the history of it, that's a good one to check out. And then what's the V? Well, that's the Roman numeral for five. So it's the fifth instruction set, RISC instruction set to come out of Berkeley. And then most importantly, why is it free and open? So it's Free and open because the specification is licensed as Creative Commons Attribution License, which is an open source license. So that's why when we say it's open, that's what it is, that the specification is under an open license. So what's different about RISC-V, because there's a lot of ISAs out there. Um, so it's a simple clean slate design. So when they started in 2010, they took like all their knowledge from previous generations and kind of did a new thing from scratch. Um, the key thing here is it has a small standard base and then multiple standard extensions. And that's also stable. So we have a base and standard that are frozen. And then we have additional functionality that's added in through optional extensions. But the base ISA and those standard extensions won't change in the future. Um, and the other thing that's nice about this, because we have those extensions, is we can scale from uh, you know, tiny microcontrollers all the way up to supercomputers, potentially. So there's several base integer ISAs. The, the basic one is 32-bit I, which is 32-bit uh, integer. And it's only 50 instructions, so you can see right there, it's pretty small. Um, for Linux, we're going to be most interested in 64-bit. And then there's also even 128-bit, which is to kind of feature-proof the address space. So there are standard extensions that um, we will be interested in in terms of running Linux on RISC-V. So, there's M for multiply, A for atomic, then there's different precision of float, F, D, and Q. And then there's G, which is shorthand for all of those. Well, for, uh, for multiply, atomic, float, and double float is G for general purpose. And then we have C for compress. So this is similar to like arm thumb. Uh, so Linux distros like Debian and Fedora are targeting RV64 GC. So if you're looking at a RISC-V core and you're wondering, oh, could it run like Debian or Fedora? you want to be looking for RV64GC. Um, so a great way to get up to speed with RISC-V is there's this short book, like 100 pages, called the RISC-V Reader. And you can find it at riscvbook.com. They even have translations to other languages. So it's a, it's a great way to get up to speed um, in like a short time. So sometimes people will ask me, or I'll help, hear people ask, like, is, is RISC-V an open source processor? But RISC-V itself is just a set of specifications under an open source license. So the implementations of RISC-V can be either open source or proprietary. But the key thing to me is that open specifications make open source implementations possible. So we have an open ISA that allows us to actually do open source processor implementations. And there are actually a few, like one out of Berkeley, there's Rocket, which is popular. Also out of ETH Zurich, um, there's a couple of other popular cores which have now been adopted by another organization called OpenHW Group. So there is actually a nice uh, community of open source processor implementations. So the other key thing for running an operating system with RISC-V is the privilege architecture. 
So this gives us three different privilege modes. So at the lowest level, we have machine mode or M mode where our firmware runs. And then we have supervisor mode or S mode where our OS kernel runs. And up the top, we have uh, user or U mode where the applications run. And as we go up, we lose privilege. So uh, U mode can't do things that S mode can do and S mode can't, things, can't do things that M mode can do. So the boot flow for RISC-V uh, is probably similar to what you see on ARM. Uh, in this case, we start up in M mode, which is that machine mode with our boot ROM and our first stage bootloader. And then at the end, we're in S mode, where U boot would load and then jump to Linux. But in between there, there's something new, and that's SBI. So SBI is, stands for Supervisor of Binary Interface. So this is a non-ISA RISC-V specification. And it's the calling convention between S mode and M mode. So if we have S mode software like the Linux kernel, one of the ways that we can make it be portable across implementations is by abstracting the platform specific functionality away. So that's what SBI allows us to do. So SBI originally was required by the Unix class platform specification. And there's a mailing list uh, where this is discussed. It's now being replaced by something that's upcoming called the RISC-V platform specification. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So there's a base extension and then there's also other extensions for like timers, interprocessor interrupts, remote fence. And then the common implementation is called OpenSBI. So this is an open, uh, open source implementation that many platforms are using. And it has like layers of implementation. So at the core, there's just a core library that implements SBI. And then you have platform specific library. And then on top of that, you have a full reference firmware that could run on a platform. And depending on the platform and the vendor, they will either maybe just use the core SBI library or the platform library or just use the full reference firmware as well. So one of the new trends with OpenSBI is to go to using something called generic platform. So these are systems where they're device tree based systems where the bootloader hands off a uh, device tree to OpenSBI. So that's how it understands all the platform specific functionality. So um, the nice thing about this is that it allows us to have the same OpenSBI binaries across different emulators and dev boards. And then there are several systems that are using generic platform right now. So one of the things that's exciting right now is uh, there's a hypervisor extension. Um, and in the hypervisor extension, we have a new mode called, so we usually had three modes, which was user, supervisor, and machine mode. Um, so hypervisor adds HS mode, which is hypervisor, supervisor, in VS mode, which is a virtualized supervisor. So this, instead of just having M mode to S mode, in between there we have the hypervisor supervisor and then the virtualized supervisor where our guest kernel could run. And then on top of that, we have the virtualized user where the guest applications would run. Oh, and then the exciting thing here is a few weeks ago, um, this specification finally went up for public review. So on Halloween, uh, it ends, and then after that point, we'll be able to move into the next phase, uh, which will get us closer, closer to this being ratified, which is exciting. So SBI, the specification is still continuing to evolve. So in the latest one, which was uh, recently um, released, uh, point three, it added um, a couple features. Uh, it added suspend uh, to the heart state management. It added performance monitoring units or PMUs. So that's what allows us to do statistics of like what the, what's happening on the CPU for things like perf. And then also a system reset extension. So rather than having like platform specific ways to do a reset, we now have an SBI, a way for the kernel to say, do a system reset and then SBI handles implementing that. So the term heart confused me at first because you see a lot of references to this. I was like, what is heart? So hardware, heart means a hardware thread. So kind of an analogy would be like, let's say my laptop here was RISC-V. I have four cores, and each of them has hyper-threading. So those would be eight hearts, you know, which is basically the number of schedulable processors in Linux. So like the number of penguins that you see when you boot up would be like the number of hearts if it was a RISC-V system. 
Another interesting like uh, area of uh, development is domain support. So this allows system level partitioning of the hardware resources um, to give different hearts uh, or to give different systems different uh, memory regions and hearts. Um, so we could have something like the, you know, in ARM they have the uh, TE, I think it is, um, and they have like the non-secure and the secure domain. So with something like open SBI domains, we could have a similar thing where we have a partitioning between non-secure domain and a secure domain. And uh, Anup Patel from Western Digital uh, gave an interesting talk about that at the last RISC V summit. So we also have uh, UEFI support pretty much across the board in RISC V. So both U-Boot and Tiano Core EDK2 both implement the UEFI um, for RISC V. A Grub 2 can also be a UEFI payload on RISC V. Um, and there's also UEFI support in uh, the kernel for RISC V. So at the point it, today, you can you know, do something like have U boot, do a boot EFI into Grub, which then boots into Linux on RISC V. Or alternatively, you could use Tiano Core EDK2. Um, and that's kind of the, the graph here of what, what it looks like when EDK2 is being used on uh, RISC V. So the, there is uh, full support in uh, QEMU for RISC V, so for both 32 bit and 64 bit. Um, there's even, uh, for one of the common dev boards, there's a machine, so you can run the same binaries in QEMU that you would run on the uh, dev board. Um, it also has, you know, when these new extensions are being worked on, they add support to QEMU. So, like, we have support for the hypervisor draft extension and the vector draft extension in there. And then from FOSDEM last year, Michael from Bootland did a really uh, great talk where in 45 minutes you build a system from scratch. So, with BuildRoot, um, building a system that has just a, a simple BusyBox uh, environment, but building everything, including OpenSPI and BuildRoot um, and uh, U-Boot in the kernel, uh, all in 45 minutes. So it's a good way to kind of familiarize yourself with RISC-V in a Linux environment if you haven't done that yet. So there's been support in the kernel. Uh, so Palmer initially added back in 4.15. Um, and if you're interested in following what's happening uh, with the Linux kernel in RISC-V, there's the Linux-RISC-V Linux mailing list. Uh, and the archives on Lore, which is another good way to keep track of it if you don't want to subscribe to the mailing list. And then last year there was a um, great talk from uh, Bjorn from the Munich RISC V meetup talking about how like it's actually a pretty nice time to get involved because it's still pretty small and it's a great way to like get in there and learn the uh, nitty gritty details of the Linux kernel. So um, and the idea that uh, Bjorn had in his talk was uh, if you go into the kernel, into documentation features, there's a shell script called uh, listarch, which if you run it with RISC-V as the argument, it will show you the kernel features for that architecture. And you can see here there's still several to-dos. So there's still work that needs to be done in RISC-V. So if you're interested in getting involved in kernel development and you're looking for an area of the kernel that needs work, RISC-V is a, definitely a, a good place to get involved. So some of the um, kind of recent patch sets uh, that are um, like notable is KVM support for the hypervisor spec. Um, the latest patch series was just posted on Monday by Anoop. Um, and now that the hypervisor spec has gone into public review, we consider that frozen and it shouldn't change. So now we're looking good at possibly getting it merged in. Though if you're interested more in like the nuance of that, I highly recommend watching the plumbers session from last week. And then there's also the vector ISA, um, which is in a draft as well, and their support for that is an RFC on the list right now. So there is support in several uh, binary distros, including Fedora. So Fedora has, aims to have a complete Fedora experience on RISC-V. And they've been working on it for several years now. So they both have a, you can go right now on your laptop and go and download the Fedora image and you can run it with QEMU and libvirt. Uh, and you can have a full graphical environment as well. And actually on your laptop, you know, if you have a modern laptop, it probably will be somewhat usable. 
And then they also support real hardware, so, and I'll talk about the dev boards in a little bit, but uh, most of the dev boards that are out there, uh, Fedora has support for. Though it's not like official Fedora, it's like, I guess, a remix technically, because it's not like an official architecture yet. And Debian also has pretty good support for RISC-V, so, you know, Debian has the massive, like, I think it's more than 20,000 now, but, you know, they have a lot of packages, and that, that graph there might be hard to read, but the top line is gray, so these are uh, Debian ports, and RISC-V is the gray line there at the top, and so over 95% of packages are being built for RISC-V, which is pretty encouraging. So there are other distros that are working on um, RISC-V, so, uh, Ubuntu has uh, support in 21.04 for QEMU and some of the Sci-5 boards. And I know they have a team that's uh, focusing on RISC-V, so I think we'll see good things out of Canonical. Um, OpenSUSE has support that's currently under development, and so it's considered an early preview. Um, Gen2 has 64-bit uh, RISC-V stages available, and Arch is still kind of like an experimental development mode. But if you don't need a full binary distro, um, open embedded slash Yocto are a really good option. Um, and there's the meta RISC-V layer that uh, Chemraj maintains and some other people. Um, so it has support for both QEMU. So you could actually right now go grab the meta RISC-V layer if you're familiar with Yocto and go and build a, a RISC-V image that would run in QEMU. And it also runs on like mo most of the boards that are available, like the Sci-Fi boards. And then an alternative to, um, you know, Yocto is BuildRoot, and BuildRoot also has support um, for RISC-V, and yeah, going back, that was the presentation that Michael did at FOSDEM that shows you going through from scratch with BuildRoot to have a bootable RISC-V system in QEMU. So the board some of you may have seen, and like I think actually it was 2017 ELC in Portland was the first time I saw it. Um, was this board called the Sci-Fi Freedom Unleashed. Um, so this was the first board, I believe, that like Linux ran on. And this had a 64-bit uh, RISC-V SOC from Sci-Fi. Um, and the, the nice thing about this was because it was a hard ASIC processor, not an FPGA, that it ran much faster. Um, so prior to this, like a lot of the implementations were running as soft cores and FPGAs. Um, which is great for flexibility, but not so fast because the clock speeds are just limited when it's a soft core. Um, so this finally gave us like a kind of a usable Linux RISC V board finally. But it was expensive, it was $1,000, uh, it's no longer made, and the chip wasn't sold separately because Sci-Fi's business is designing IP, not making chips and boards. But it was cool to see Linux with a full Fedora, GNOME environment running on a RISC-V board. So more recently, Microchip has the Polar Fire SOC. So this has the same uh, quad core complex that's in the Sci-Fi Unleashed uh, SOC, um, but in this case, Microchip's added in FPGA fabric as well. It also has support for DDR4 and PCI Express. The other nice thing here is it's a full uh, commercial product family. Uh, from microchips, so um, it, they'll be available in distribution, there'll be good public documentation, all those things that come along with, you know, uh, um, a full product family from a top tier chip, chip vendor. Um, and if you're wondering, like, I didn't think, I didn't know microchip did FPGAs, it's the former Micro Semi business unit and they acquired them, so this came out of that. And last year they came out with the Icicle board, um, so this is a $500 board, you can order it on Crowd Supply currently. Um, so it's still kind of expensive because it has a very large FPGA um, fabric on that, on that chip, um, but um, well, it's half the price of the Unleashed board and also adds a big FPGA, so that's a, a benefit, though still maybe too expensive for some use cases. So at the really low end, there was this nice chip called the Kendrite K210. It's actually dual core, 400 megahertz, which is actually pretty nice, you know, um, you could you could make a usable Linux system with that, but it only had eight megabytes of SRAM and no DRAM, no external memory interface. Um, so you can get dev boards that are like thirteen dollars, like this one here. Um, and support was added back in 2019 in Linux 5.8 uh, by Damien Lamal and some other people. 
um, and they're supporting it for several of the boards in U-Boot. So it's also a nice way, if you just want to run Linux on RISC V, for less than like $15, you can go through that and do it. But it's not necessarily particularly all that useful because it only has eight megabytes. Beyond that, um, it doesn't have an MMU that's functional. So the MMU implements the pre-draft spec, so it's not supported by the kernel, which means we don't have shared libraries. So actually, the eight megabytes runs out really, really, really fast. Uh, Damien's still trying to work on some ways to get around that, um, so there's a link in there discussion of this, uh, this ELF to binary flat converter, which is one, maybe, maybe one way to maybe get around things, but with eight megabytes, it's limited. But it was a nice way to get some hands-on physical RISC-V hardware that could run Linux. So Sci-5 um, recently launched, well, actually, I guess it was like the end of last year, but it's shipping now, the unmatched board. So this is kind of their next-gen core and a new SOC called the FU740 instead of the 540. So same sort of configuration of like four uh, cores that would be running Linux, but it's much faster. It's also in this interesting mini ITX form factor. So you can make your, you can actually make like a, like a workstation. Um, and it has like PCI Express and M.2 connectors. So you can actually make like a, a useful developer machine with this and do native RISC-V development. So another high-end design comes from Alibaba has a chip design division called T-Head. And they have this design called the Jean T910. So they announced this a little while ago. Um, it's a 16 core, two and a half gigahertz RISC-V RISC processor design. Um, it's uh, really high-end. It's a 12-stage out-of-order core. So it's targeted towards high performance. They wrote a really interesting paper about it, which is linked there. Um, they're actually using it in some of Alibaba's production in FPGAs for certain things. Um, and it's kind of comparable to an A73. And uh, as part of this, uh, Alibaba surprised, every, surprised everyone. Uh, Alibaba T had surprised everyone back in January when they said, like, surprise, we ported Android to uh, this, this test chip. Um, which at the time, like, no one really thought we were close to having Android really running in any meaningful way on RISC-V. Um, so this is really exciting. If you click on that link, it takes you to the GitHub repo. And there is now an Android special interest group um, with RISC-V International. So they have meetings to kind of push this work forward. And this board here that you see here with this, like, cell phone-shaped display on it uh, is called the ICE board. Um, so this was like a low quantity test board that they did with this test SOC, um, which has that, uh, that uh, 910 design in it. So it has two cores in there. So this isn't something you can buy, but it was a really interesting, I think, proof of concept. But uh, so T had has uh, multiple um, processor designs that they've done. And another core is called the C906. So this is much smaller. It's just the five stage in order pipeline. Uh, up to one gigahertz. So Allwinner, who many of you may be familiar with from their ARM SOCs, has taken the C906 core and put it into a SOC called the D1. So the D1 is probably like the first low cost RISC-V SOC that can run Linux like reasonably well, because the Kendrite's kind of limited by not having an external memory bus. So Allwinner, um, Allwinner has a division called Allwinner Online, and they've produced this official dev board called the Neza. Um, and you can find it online for like starting around like $115. There's several different companies that are like reselling it um, outside of China. So it has that one gigahertz single core, and then also has either one gigabytes or two gigabytes of memory. Um, and it's kind of like in a form factor that's common for single board computers. So um, if you're interested in getting develop, development boards, RISC-V International has a really good program um, called the Developer Boards Initiative. And the idea here is that RISC-V International wants to get boards out into open source developers' hands. Um, so for this initiative, like RISC-V International is looking to work with everyone that's making boards. Right now, this is really just uh, the all winner D1 board and the Sci-5 Unmatched board. Um, so if you want to participate, you can click on the link there. It takes you to a form. Uh, one thing is it's preferred that you're a member of RISC-V International, but individuals 
and nonprofits can join free of cost. So if you're interested in doing this, probably best if you sign up, become a member, and then you fill out the form. And I'll talk a little bit more about like the different things that you can involve with um, in Risk 5 International as well. Um, so explain what you're going to do with it. So it might be like, oh, I want to add RISC V support to a particular upstream open source project that I'm working on. Um, but I will say, don't overestimate the hardware you need. So the most common board that we have available is the D1 board with one gigabyte of memory. Um, and then we do have some of the Sci-5 unmatched, but because they're so much more expensive and such fewer quantity, like, you know, don't, don't say you need 16 gigabytes of memory if you don't need it, because you're much more likely to get a board if you say, you know, you have lower specifications that can be met by the D1 board. So uh, the SUNZ community has, has a great reputation for supporting the all-winner SOCs, the ARM-based all-winner SOCs, and they've continued to do that with the D1. Um, so there's a nice wiki page on, Soon, on the SUNZ website. Um, there's also a page for the D1 SOC and then a page for the NESA board specifically. And Samuel Holland is one of the developers in that community, and he's done a great job of trying to get different mainline uh, projects to run. Um, so there's like the low-level bootloader, and then on top of that, uh, OpenSBI, U-Boot, and Linux. So he has his own branches right now. And uh, if you're interested, um, uh, check out the wiki, check out these repos, um, see what he's working on. There's still things that need to be resolved, but if you want to, you can grab these like recent versions of the upstream projects with patches on it and run something close to mainline. And Fedora also runs on the D1 NESA board. So Wei Fu, who's also a RISC-V ambassador and an engineer at Red Hat, um, he right now has a Fedora Rawhide image with XFCE for a desktop environment that runs on the D1. And he also made these nice diagrams of like the boot flow and like the SD card partition layout. So if you click on that link, it takes you to the Fedora wiki, you can check all of this out there. So there is a bit of an issue in terms of getting support for the D1 SOC upstream. And it's mainly due to the C906 core in it. So um, there was a great session last week at Plumbers called What's the Problem with the D1 upstream? And Gal Ren is like the main kernel engineer at THUD, and they also had someone from All Winter and then Wei Fu as well. Um, so please check out the slides if you're interested. In. You can click on the links to their slides. There's also the full recording in the live stream. I have the timestamp in there. So the SOC itself is mostly reusing what they already have in an ARM SOC that's fully supported. So all the peripherals and stuff, you know, all the drivers for everything, that, all that's upstream but there's some issues with the RISC V core that need to be addressed. So there are some not critical things to boot that are really performance op optimizations, like uh, cache synchronization, instruction cache synchronization, which helps out with, uh, I think, like JITs for like Java, um, and TLB synchronizations in the vector. Um, so these are like performance things. They're not critical to be able to boot and have a working system. But there is something that actually is serious and we can't boot until we get this resolved. We can't boot an upstream kernel until this is resolved. Um, so Tia designed these uh, C9XX cores, so both the C910 and the C906 I talked about. So the core that's in that D1 chip back in 2019. And when they designed this, there was no, like, there was no way per the RISC-V specs to be able to handle uh, DMA on non-coherent interconnects. Um, and the RISC V privilege spec back then said, uh, don't use incoherent interconnects. Um, have your hardware handle the coherency for you. Which is actually a nice way of doing it. However, you know, with all winner, they want to make affordable SOCs, which is good because then we can build low cost dev boards, which everyone wants low cost dev boards. And people want an affordable chip that they can use in their project like projects or products. Um, and one of the things there is to make these lower cost SOCs, non coherent interconnects, um, so are, are usually cheaper to use in designs. Um, so we kind of have this thing where it's like, the spec said, every, all the hardware should just handle the coherency. However, 
if you looked at some of those previous dev boards and test SOCs, they're pretty expensive. So like the, 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 the cost down SOC used non-coherent interconnects to try and make it a lower cost design, but then we have this issue of the hardware doesn't just magically handle the coherency for us. Uh, and Gaoran did post about this back in 2019, but like the extension for handling this was still in a really early phase, so it was kind of like uh, they, they kind of had to decide to do something, and unfortunately they didn't quite make the, like, the best decisions, which it was not possible for them to really know back then, but like it's kind of one of those things, we're in a situation where we need to like have a resolution on this. So what happened in the meantime was this thing called page-based memory types or PBMT extension. So this came out of the virtual memory task group. So with RISC-V there's all these different task groups for different areas. So there's one that works on virtual memory. And this specification came out. Um, so similar to what we have in ARM is we can describe for a page the type of memory it is. Is it normal memory? Is it cacheable memory? Is it IO memory? So like these sorts of things. Which RISC-V didn't have a way of doing it until this extension got proposed. The nice thing though is this extension has now been frozen and put into a 45 day public review period, which I believe will also end on Halloween. So we are actually close to maybe going into next year this becoming a ratified specification. So for future chips that are designed that don't want to have uh, coherent interconnects, they can use this extension and be able to handle um, you know, the caching behavior for pages with these extensions. However, we have the issue of, you know, T had made certain decisions two years ago, and as it were, they don't really match up with what the PBMT extension has. So, you, I don't know if you can read that, but basically the deal here is the bits, they're using the same bits in the PTE format, the page table entry format, but the bits, what, what the bits mean are not the same, and even like the semantics are different. So like, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. It's not just like, oh, like bit one here was like non-cacheable, but like bit three over here is not cacheable. It's like the semantics of what those combinations mean are different. So it's not something where we can really easily work it out. So there's a lot of concern about merging support for this custom PTE format into the kernel, because it does not conform to a RISC-V specification. So the first thing that's easy to tackle is, well, now that PBMT is a frozen spec and under public review, we can start to get ready to add support to Linux for the page-based memory types, which is good, and we need that anyways. Uh, so Gaoran has posted up a patch just recently, like in the last week for that. Um, and there's a lot of good discussion on that patch. Though we still have the situation is, once that gets merged in, you know, future people will be able to use it, but then what do we do about the, about the C906 core and the D1? So that is still something that's, we've not come to a conclusion yet. So I would say if you're interested, go watch the stream from Plumbers. I took a lot of notes as well and also watched the mailing list. So this is kind of one of those things where like, you know, we finally have a low cost dev board that can run Linux and like it can actually run pretty close to mainline, but in order for it to actually run mainline, we need like some resolution on this uh, page table uh, format issue. So I'm not sure exactly what happened, but um, hopefully this caught you up to speed. If you're interested, you can now start following the mailing list and, and see what's going on. I mean, for, for a practical sense from the users, like it's not that substantial of a patch set. So, you know, it might be one of those things where like the D1's almost upstream, you know, like, like most everything's upstream and then we have like this patch series to fix the page table format. But hopefully we don't have to do that. Hopefully there's a way to handle this as a RADA or something like that. Um, upstream, but it really kind of depends on if the maintainer of the Arch support in Linux for RISC-V is able to be convinced that this won't set a bad precedent. So let's say you don't have any hardware at all. Well, one of the really nice things you can use is Renode. It's an open source project from App Micro, um, and it can simulate a full hardware system. Uh, and it even has configurations for different boards. So I mentioned that Sci-Fi Sci Unleash board 
that's expensive and rare. So let's say you wanted to pretend like you had one of those. You can go install Renode, and then on your laptop here, you can have the full High Five Unleashed running. And actually, because you know, if you have a modern laptop, it's very fast as compared to like these RISC-V boards. So it actually runs pretty well. It doesn't feel like a super slow like simulator. So it's actually usable. So I mentioned a lot like these different specs, which is probably confusing if you've never really looked at them before. And there's all these different new specs and extensions being proposed. So if you're interested in this, I highly recommend getting involved. Um, if you're not a member of RISC-V International, you can join for free as an individual or a nonprofit. And then once you get involved, once, once you sign up, become a member, uh, there's a lot of links and emails and groups and meetings and it can be confusing. So there's this technical wiki landing page, which is like the best single place to go to try and find links and things to different things. So from here you can see the technical organization chart. You can see what ISA extensions are on the deck for freezing and which ones are coming up for ratification. You can see the different technical working groups. You can see the, um, you know, the software ecosystem, basically everything that's going on. It's kind of like a central place to, to uh, go off from there and find different resources. And then the way that most people uh, interact on this is through mailing lists. Um, so there's the uh, list.ris5.org, um, which is groups.io run and once you become a member, you can participate in the list, but all the lists are public. So even without being a member, you can go look at the public archives of the mailing list. But if you want to like participate in the mailing list, then you should become a member. But you can still do that uh, free of cost as an individual. And then a lot of these different groups that I mentioned have bi-weekly or monthly meetings. And you can find all of those on the technical meetings calendar. Um, and if you've previously been involved in this, it might be confusing because we used to have a different calendar, which was called tech groups calendar. And then we don't use that anymore. We use technical meetings calendar. So if you, if you are like me and you used to attend these meetings, make sure you're looking at the new one now. So here's just a screenshot of right now what it's like. So you can see here like for many days there's, there's things happening. So there's maybe like four that I participate in. So there's like bi-weekly meetings for them. So you know, every other week I'll have a meeting that I attend. So I wanted to go into some that are important for, for a full operating system like Linux. So one is the cache management operations task group. So this is another thing that is also relevant to SOCs, especially low cost SOCs that want to be able to handle um, devices, peripherals that are going to do DMA that are not on a coherent uh, interconnect. So they need to manage the coherency of the DMA uh, um, transactions. So there wasn't really a way to do this until this extension got proposed. So this allows us to be able to do things like invalidate, clean, and flush like the L2 cache, for example. Uh, so this one also now is under a 45-day public review. So hopefully soon, going into next year, it'll get ratified and people can start building hardware that have, has these new cache management instructions. Um, however, there's already chips that exist that don't have that. So one of the things that we can do is we can implement these C this cache management operations in the kernel. And then if we're on hardware that doesn't have these instructions, with RISC-V, it'll always trap into SBI. And then, for example, OpenSBI could emulate those instructions, which wouldn't be fast, but it would be a way to handle these for, for older hardware. Another one that's important for operating systems like Linux is the advanced interrupt architecture. So we had these existing um, interrupt controllers called the PLIC, and now we have the advanced platform level interrupt controller. And we also now have the incoming message signal interrupt controller, or MSI, which is important for PCI Express. Um, so with the new AIA, we can handle things like PCI Express buses. Kind of similar to this, but different than AIA, is the ACLINT. So this is like the local interrupt controller that's on the, on the core. And we used to use this thing called the sci 5 clint but that was very limited in what it could do. So this one kind of reimagines that with more capabilities, but it doesn't bake backwards compatibility with the sci 5 clint that's already used in a lot of existing boards. 
and there was a presentation last week at Plumbers from Manoop. Um, he breaks it down on this table here so you can kind of see the different combinations, which if this is all new to you, it won't probably make any sense, but once you read a little bit more, it's kind of useful because you can kind of see the different um, combinations of things that would be allowed in what, under what scenario so that would be. And then finally, uh, a very important one for Linux is the risc five platform specification. So if you're thinking like, well, there's all these different extensions and letters and numbers, and like, how do I know if like my software will run on a risc five system? So this is what the platform specification is trying to solve. So in the platform specification, we have OSA, which is A for application. So this is meant for a full operating system like Linux. And then it has, it says for the ISA level, we have these profiles, which are kind of like combinations of those little extension letters like RV64GC. So this says like you need to have these ISA extensions. So there's that level. And then beyond that, we need to talk about the system beyond just the ISA, like interrupts and, and how the different like serial ports and these sorts of things. Um, so all that's in the specification as well. And for people that come from the ARM world, one thing that will be of interest is that part of the baseline here in the OSA platform specification is that you have to comply with eBBR. So, for example, you can use device tree to describe the hardware, but you need to boot with UEFI. In you boot, which is fine. Um, and then for the server extension, it mandates ACPI, which I know, but you know, it actually is kind of expected for servers. So, there's also M platform for microcontrollers, but it's not very well defined right now. There was a session last week on the platform specification, so if you're interested in this, check that out because it's all the people that are involved just talked about this for like a couple of hours last week. And finally, I mentioned ACPI, so for the server extension, there is now actually a proof of concept of ACPI on RISC-V. So, you know, in that feature where we have high-end RISC-V processors running on servers, this will be a part of that. So if you're interested in that, this was also a presentation at Plumbers last week about how the current ACPI proof of concept is working. And to end on, I just wanted to, if, you, if you're interested in this, and we've just been talking about this for 50 minutes, if you're interested in Linux on RISC-V, there was just uh, five hours of discussions uh, last week at Plumbers from like the people that are actually doing all this development. So uh, the best thing I can do if you want to learn more is go watch the live stream from Plumbers um, last week. So uh, with that, uh, are there any questions? Oh, in the front, yeah. The, 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 so there's a lot you can do with FPGAs because you don't have the whole 18 months to do. Oh, sorry, yes. So the question was, what's the difference in the context where we have a RISC-V core and FPGA versus in one of these uh, ASIC chips that I was talking about? So uh, the one limiting factor in the FPGAs is even on the really fancy ones, like 200 megahertz is like super high end clock rate for a soft core and FPGA. So like you're limited in terms of your clock rate of the core and the FPGA. However, it, you have a lot of flexibility to do things. So there is actually a really strong community of people doing FPGI, RISC-V FPGA designs in Linux um, on FPGAs. And one of the things you can do is like you create like systems with many, many cores. Like there's a, um, a group out of, uh, I think Stanford or something like that, Princeton, uh, called Open Python, and they have like a thousand cores. So they're running Linux on a thousand cores in FPGA. So, you know, maybe the cores are only hundred megahertz, but you can scale it out massively. So kind of different ways of approaching problems. So and FPGAs are great for that um, because the downside to the hardships is it takes like 18 months or more to get one made, right? So. They, um, it could, you could have like the same design they tend to sometimes be designed somewhat differently to take better advantage of the resources that are in an FPGA versus like a, a silicon design. Um, but it can also just be the same design. Um, like the rocket core from Berkeley has been put into FPGAs. It's also been taped out in ASICs. Um, there is an interesting one called VEX RISC-V that's really good for FPGA um, designs. Um, and there's a project called Linux on Lidex, Vex, Risk V, or just email me, I can send you the link. And then like within 
a half an hour, you can have Linux running on a soft core and FPGA uh, with like multiple cores. So it's, it's a great way to like experiment with things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not just uh, for development too, you have uh, compiler and yeah, uh, so kind of, you're kind of asking about like the software tool chains that exist, compilers and IDEs. So um, for tool chains, it's pretty much you would expect like GCC and LLVM um, all exist. So most of the major open source tool chains already have had support for several years for RISC-V. Um, Any graphics? For IDEs, um, for graphical IDEs, um, so a lot of the commercial vendors um, definitely have, this, there's a bunch of different commercial vendors that do RISC-V um, um, development like they develop cores and they also give you tools. So like Sci-Fi, for example, has an IDE that's based on Eclipse. And most of the different um, RISC-V IP vendors all have, uh, yeah, like graphical IDEs, usually based on Eclipse. Um, yeah, yeah. And the R node is actually independent? The which one? The R, you said the R node, the simulator? Oh, Renode, yeah. So Renode is yeah, in, independent. Um, it is similar to what QEMU does, but it kind of has like all, everything included. So you can just say like, present this board to me. So uh, it's similar to what QEMU does, but I would say it's easier to use and, and more full, full featured. So you can configure Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really great because you can say like, you know, um, like I want to have the same environment I have on this physical dev board. Or if you're developing something, you can like configure it to act like hardware that doesn't even exist yet as well. Um, but they have, if you look for, if you search for Renode, there's a lot of great talks from Ant Micro about it. How about my execution uh, unit? How fast? How many instructions? I'm not sure about the exact speed, but I would just say, like, it's not, like, terribly slow. Like, a ISA simulator is really, really slow. Um, so this is actually, like, usable, usable because it's emulating it. It's not actually, like, simulating the actual core. Um, uh-huh. Well, I think there was one over here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for for the people that couldn't hear, um, uh, Matthew, who's the from from Fedora, um, is, is was that saying? Well, it's a respin because it's, there's not like official rack mount hardware yet. So if you could get a Risk Five server that you could put in your data center, then it could become like a, an official Fedora. So how far away are we from that? I mean, probably the closest right now is the Sci Five on Matchboard because it's mini ITX. So you can you can kind of make a server um, and actually. Uh, Stefano from Misfire International over here, uh, um, he's, I think, involved in some uh, CI and testing. Like, I think we even, I, I even have an idea of having like a data center colo with some, some boards. So um, they're not that fast, but they're usable. And like, um, so David Abner Rachmanoff, who does the Fedora um, US um, builds for that, like, you know, it's, it's you know, they, they do it natively, but it's not like, they can do it natively, but it's not super fast, you know, so like, the point where we could do like a, a native building, I think we kind of need like the next generation of like SOCs to come out for that to be really be feasible, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. For those not using Slack, could you show the link? Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, so that's the, that's the URL there. Um, did that kind of answer the question or? Yeah. Yeah, like, Native compiling on RISC V now, like the best thing you can get is really the the Sci Five on Matchboard, which does have PCI Express, so we can use NVMe. Um, but it's you know it's it's not going to be anything like what you'd have in other uh, like ARM or, or um, x86. Um, but I know there are companies working on things, so hopefully maybe a year from now or two years from now we'll have. Um, you know, better hardware. And that's kind of what the platform spec is doing. Like, imagine this feature where we do have companies making, like, servers, and then, like, in order for distros to like it, like, the platform specification will hopefully be able to say, like, oh, this is a, you know, a RISC-V, um, um, it complies with the RISC-V OSA platform specification, so we know it'll run, like, Fedora on this server that I buy. But I think we're probably, like, a year or two away from that future um, uh, to have, like, actual usable servers. That are risk five. Um, were there any other uh, questions in the room? Otherwise, I was going to take a look at Slack here um, to see. Um, most of my colleagues uh, are in France, so I, I feel uh, 
feel bad that like uh, most people aren't able to like uh, you know be with us here uh, in person. But um, I don't actually see anything uh, in Slack. But if anyone has questions, you can hit me up in Slack or email me. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>